You know me, Daddy T. This is the podcast where I have comedians, artists, creatives. It was comedians only, and then the pandemic really, you know, just blew the whole thing open. Um, where I have people come on and tell me something they want to get off their chest. I'm very excited for my guest today. We actually have never met in real life, but we've done a few Zoom shows together now over the course of um, the last year. And um, she recently uh, uh, featured for Greg Proofs on a show that I uh, hosted, which was really cool. She's been all over. She's done The Moth, she's been on NPR, and uh, I found a tweet that I really enjoy that I'm going to read before I bring her up. Um, she, where she, on Twitter she said, motion to rename algebra as X going to give it to you, and I love a math pun. It's Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. Oh my god, did I just say it wrong again? I literally... No, you said it perfect. <laughs> you are amazing. It's funny because I wanted to talk, I was like, I want to talk about the name thing because right before we recorded we were talking about it. And then in, I got really in my head, even though I'm like, I feel like when I wasn't thinking about it, it was right. <laughs> let, me, let, let me put your mind and heart at ease. So my last name it, in the my OG language, Tamil, is pronounced Lakshmi Narayanan. And so that's really hard for non-native Tamil speakers to say, because you kind of have to roll an R. You have to put a syllable in a way that English people you know, people who speak English don't do. So there's all kinds of hard associated with it. But if you just say all the syllables in the best way you can, I count that as a win. So <laughs> well, you... I appreciate that because I'm sure as a performer, you get asked all the time. But I actually almost like when you said it in the like, it makes sense if you say it all together in the, the way it's meant to be said, it makes sense. That almost to me feels easier. I mean, I'm also like bilingual. So I feel like uh, I learning something in its original language actually makes more sense to me. And we were kind of what I want to touch on before when I was like, oh, let's talk about this on the pod was uh, when I, you know, was making a fool of myself and was like, how do I say this again, even though you've told me? But then you were talking about how like, it's annoying when people don't try. And I really um, resonate with that because there's so many, it's just like a bias or it's a cognitive bias because like, there's tons of names of Hollywood actors and actresses and they're not all white, but it's like, if once you know them, you just know it and that's just the name and uh it might be harder to learn at first but i feel like people put up a block because they're like oh this is hard it's not my problem it's yours instead of like this is hard let me work a little harder and once i know it i'll know it you know yeah i i i like that because it, it is about working hard but also i feel like so english isn't my first language my first language mm -hmm. is tamil and sometimes people did make fun of me for the way i said things in english and so I would never want to make someone feel bad for attempting to do something that's outside the norm for them. So if they, tr if people try, I'm very impressed. If people get it right, like you did, I'm very grateful. And if people are just like, uh, I can't, can I just call you Daya? Well, can you shorten it? Uh, uh, uh. And they're like being an ass about it. Then I actually double down and I'm like, no, you have to say the whole thing. I'm going to write it down for you. But if people are just generally like, hey, I'm doing my best. This is hard. I'm nervous. Then I, I give people a lot of leeway because they're just doing their best. Uh, but I just decided to have my whole name because people remember it. And yeah. people uh, kind of, even if they can't say it, they'll remember seeing it. They'll remember like person with the long last name or, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's a way that people, rem I have a story so Kamala Harris used to live in San Francisco and I ran for some like local elected office and I lost. But oh, wow. Kamala Harris was one of the people in the room that was voting because oh, wow. she's like, you know, an official. And she came up to me and she goes, I saw your name. You go, you get that delegate position because she's <sighs> she's half Tamil, which is my ethnic uh -huh. origin. And then oh, I saw wow. then I made it to the Democratic Convention uh, somehow oh, wow. as, a, as, a, as a blogger slash journalist. And I ran into Kamala Harris and she goes, I knew you'd make it. So she remembered me from my whole Amazing. last name on that thing. So the vice president of the United States remembers me because of my last name. I mean, she doesn't now because I haven't seen her in years. Well, you don't know that. I mean, she's the yeah. vice president. She's probably really good at remembering things. She she's probably is. Be. So I'm like, I, if sure. I didn't change my name for the vice president of the United States, I'm not going to change it for some guy at an <laughs> who can't say my name. 
I feel like I was gonna ask for a good confession, but I feel like that's a great good confession to start with. Is it? So like, is, is yeah, because I like to just as a like kind of icebreaker to get to know you, um, or for the listeners to get to know you, ask a good confession. But unless you had another one, but I feel like Kamala Harris remembering you from your name is great. Yeah, and I also wanted to address, you know, she's biracial, so she's um, black via I think Jamaica on her father's side, and then uh, Tamilian South Asian on her mother's side and i have been up close to her where she wears a ganesha pendant and i've seen oh, okay. her so she's equally connected to all parts of her culture so that's why for biracial people i think it's so hard when yeah. people are like are you are you really this are you really that which one are you more so i just feel like people like her like she really embraces who she is completely like she can make dosa she yeah. was part of a black sorority like this is the entirety of who she is. So yeah, I think I mean, that's, that's like, only, I feel like white people don't get put to that scrutiny because nobody's like, oh, I'm white, but I'm only 20% racist. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> that, I had to do that. But I mean, it's not a bit, but it just came out. But the point of being like, of course, nobody, like the wording of like seeing half this, half that, I understand it so that we can say you're all, but you're not really half anything. You're all everything because yeah. that's not really how identity and culture works. Um, I, so, I yeah, like I've it. gotten out of that binary thinking more. Like I used to say I was bisexual. Every once in a while I'll say it if I'm like traveling for the you know, sake of uh, small towns that don't really like know the differences. Like, but I, I identify as queer now because I do think it's like, I don't really think it's like one or the other. There's like so many genders in between and I just think queer captures it, but I don't know. I like that word uh, queer also for people who don't neatly fit into categories. I, I mean, I live in San Francisco, so of course I've heard every kind of story about relationships and love. One of my friends, she, you know, identifies as a lesbian her entire life. Mm -hmm. She started dating this amazing, handsome, smart, successful trans man. And she's like, what does this make me now? I fought very hard for the lesbian title. I don't want to give it up. So then she was like, you know, I'm just going to identify as queer because I don't want people thinking I'm a straight woman. <laughs> you know, she's like that. And I'm like, as a straight woman, I I'm so sorry that we have given you this impression of how we Wait, are. Wait, is this um, a comedian? Because Ariel Norman has a story like that. Oh, no, this is not a comedian. Oh, okay. Well, Ariel's been on this pod, but I was also on the same network as us. So I'm, and if anyone's listening check out uh, gender fluids. The, the confession that Ariel did was that um, I started dating a man, but like I was like all lesbian for basically up until then, which I was like, but it, like a trans man, but like in a way that was like, what does this make me? Which is really funny because it does make you realize the whole point is that there isn't a norm, like heteronormativity, but words do change the way we view it. Cause it's like, well, are we going so queer that we're back? But it's, it's just a circle. It's not supposed to be like there's one normal thing, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and it's also like generational based because I know older lesbians who are like, you don't understand how much we fought for this, how much yeah. we had to march in the streets for this title. And now we don't want to just be, you know, queer. We, we, <laughs> we, we got discriminated against so we could call ourselves lesbians. So I think it's there's a lot of respect in just asking someone how they prefer to yeah. identify and just respecting that because there's no one way for anyone. But I want to say, I love your bit, Teresa. I hope you bring it to the stage, the 20% racist, because it's almost oh. like they took a, a 23andMe test and they're like, you're, you know, 50% Irish, you know, 25% Gaelic and 10% racist. I mean, I know not all white people are racist, but I just mean the way that we describe, like, like, yeah, of course, as people who are not as represented typically in like politics and media, we are going to hang on to things that look similar. Like like you mentioned the dosas and the black sorority, which in that situation makes sense because that is like being proud of her identity. But like the it is interesting because they in another context, if it was like a white person trying to prove that they actually, you know, like was one sixteenth Indian and was it's all about intention, you know, like there's no way that you have to be but you can kind of tell when someone's doing it for the clout you know like elizabeth warren who quickly backpedaled but um sure, sure. It, in those situations it can also feel like oh you, now you're just limiting the identity to like a food which is mo why i said that white person thing because i don't really think white people are racist but it would be the equation of like saying like well these are all the things that make you white so are you 100 percent that or not which is mm -hmm. Just so strange, yeah. I, I've always struggled with like that sort of identity thing because 
Hollywood, I don't know if you have this experience too, like being a comedian and performer, but like going in meetings in general, people kind of want to put you in a box. And I know you've got a lot of, oh, so I do want to talk about this because I didn't know this until I looked up your Wikipedia. You have like crazy um, history of like being in so many industries. Like you were an investor in eBay, you went to MIT and you're a successful comedian. So like- So, I, I, so my Wikipedia page is very wrong. So please do not- Oh, if, okay. I, well, I, is that I not never, true? <laughs> I was never an investor in eBay. I'm not- wow. really, Why I does it say that? Because some because you don't make your own Wikipedia page. Someone else makes it. And so they just put whatever they wanted on there. So I mean this wow. this, this happens to me a lot. Like this one so time oh my I was I rented a party bus for my birthday and I invited all my friends and I went to this, you know, regular party and I was talking to some people and I was like, Oh, I got a party bus for my birthday and these women were like we work for a major Beaujolais supplier. Uh, can we come on your party bus and we'll bring free wine? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, but you, we have to say that you're a very high, uh, you know, ranking influencer. So we write something about you. And so they, uh. they, they made up some stuff like Daya is a marketing executive. So just to send to their oh. boss. Then they came on the party bus with shirts that said, we are the Beaujolais. So it was like Beaujolais the ladies. So the Beaujolais ladies were on my bus. Uh, the same bus, uh, someone who's now in the California Assembly, who was an elected office, got on the bus. It was like the most wild time. Oh but it was all God. because I just made up something about myself. So, That's so funny. The, the information that is on that page, there's so many inaccuracies about <gasps> me. But uh, I'm happy to tell you the truth of who I am. But. I don't have a lot of money. I was never an investor in eBay. That's just so wild because I was like, whoa, that's like really cool. Because we're, we're talking about being in boxes, but I'm like, well, that I, I mean, even without the eBay thing, it's like clearly yeah. you have lived a lot of cool, interesting stories. So it's like yeah. that sort of. But I did go to MIT. I did go to MIT. Yeah. Um, yes, I can. I, I'm like, that would be. Well, I guess that, that could be all lies. That would be a really funny um, thing to do, actually, as a comedian. Is just to have an all lies. Yeah. Yeah. And just see how many believe it um no it's like it's wild uh because i'm also wondering if some of that has like they're like we're talking about sort of how much harder you have to work when you're not like the the quote unquote quote norm even though there's no such thing but like you know like maybe uh like a, a white girl comedian who is also funny but like maybe has less like interesting facts outside of doing comedy may just be seen as like, oh, that's all you need to do. Whereas, I don't know if you feel this way, but I also like came, I grew up in the Bay and have a lot of that sort of Bay Area, like do everything mm -hmm. mentality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I do feel like you have to have like 10 things to like someone else's one interesting thing just to like be in the room. Um, you can't just be like, I'm a comedian. You'd be like, I'm a comedian. And also here are all my other things that I've done that show my identity as, you know, an activist and a queer person and Asian person and you're like, or I could just do comedy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you do ha have to show that you're, you do a lot of different things because people are like, we're looking for, you know, performer, actor. We're looking for writer, performer. We're looking for singer, songwriter. We're look so people want to have someone who is good at many different things. But I think what that does is it makes people um, shallow in their goodness. Mm. So, mm -hmm. for example, I, I know how to edit videos, like I know how to edit stuff, but I work with an editor who's so much better than me. Yeah, yeah. Like she is amazing at editing and she has great comedic timing. Um, so she's awesome. And I would, of course, want her professionally to be my collaborator or I could just like go on, you know, my, you know, cheap ass software and edit it myself. But I never am like I'm a, a filmmaker and a writer and <laughs> I think if you have too many of those well, hyphens, I feel attacked. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, no. But for me, I'm saying I'm not a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm a writer. I'm a comedian. I'm a storyteller. I'm good at those things. I am. Thank you for noticing. I am good at math also. But I feel like I'm good if, at math puns. Yeah, I math love math puns. Play. I love yeah. a good wordplay, especially when it comes to like. I just like a kind of classic, like a math. Why my um, high school did like a calculus camp and they which, made which high school. In the oh, it's a gun in Apollo. That's that's a great. They have a great theater program too. Oh yeah, I did it there. Yeah. But they did um they had church at calculus camp and it's like every year I don't know if they still do this but it was like before the weekend before prom and it was like a cool thing to see like cool in the sense that it was like 
everyone knows it's like not cool, but it's a fun thing the seniors did because it was like universally accepted that people wanted to do well in school. Mm -hmm. um, and they had shirts that said, let's talk about, you know, like the derivative of E to the X. So it looks like sex. It's the uh, stupid, uh, like I've, <laughs> I've always loved stupid math, like it, stupid math jokes that are like trying to be edgy because there's no way <laughs> it's just funny to me. Yeah, I like I like dumb, dumb jokes, too. Like I I just hung out with um, two of my friends in San Francisco. Both of them are gay men of color and they're comedians. We just said the dumbest shade and the stupidest <laughs> things that were funny to nobody. We hollered at a guy riding a lime and we just called him Green Daddy or something. I don't know. It was just, <laughs> there was nothing funny to anyone else about what we did, but we enjoyed ourselves. I think you have to laugh at things that are silly and dumb and, you know, not just like you can't like be a snob about it. I I watched this movie that nobody likes. It's, what is it? It's starring the fat boys. Do you know one of the fat boys just died? He, he was like a very skilled beatboxer. Um, and the movie is called The Disorderlies, starring the fat boys. And this was at the height of their fame when they were so good at beatboxing. And then someone gave them a movie deal. And basically their whole brand was we're fat. We like Oreos. We like pizza. We're also good at beatboxing. And that that's their whole brand. And it's like the silliest, dumbest <laughs> movie. But I found it hilarious. That's so fun. I like wordplay. And this happened today where I realized sometimes I'll almost like sacrifice the truth of the situation for the wordplay because it's so funny to me. And <laughs> I like love, like as a, I'm a slightly immature comedian, I've always enjoyed like... <laughs> making stupid like sexual innuendos that are not you know in the right context of like it's so dumb like you when you make a joke you're like oh you know whatever like the you know uh that's what she said type of yeah childhood humor but um to the detriment like now I've been hanging out with my boyfriend a lot during pandemic and i'll just get so comfortable that i'm like riffing with him like a comic and he's not and then i'll have to be like but i don't really don't disrespect me because i'll like he said something this morning when i was like washing the dishes and he didn't, he was trying to be like, don't leave them alone. Like I, I'm going to get a spray bottle, spray you like joking that, um, yeah. to leave it. But then I was like, oh, I'll let you spray me. But I was just like making, stu I love making stupid jokes. I love it. But then I have to be like, but I don't, it's not real. Don't, <laughs> cause I'm like, that was for the joke. Yeah. It was the moment. And now pretend I didn't say that. Please respect me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you're. <laughs> You're allowed to have an offstage sense of humor that's not your onstage sense of humor. I, I love I love seeing people fall down. I, I mean, that's my, I love that. I love uh, like immature jokes. I, I love nerd jokes. You know, we don't have to be the same person we are on stage offstage. Cause I mean, if I only laughed at those kind of jokes, it would be really hard cause it's hard to write. Yeah. That's true. That's a good way to put it. Like you don't necessarily need to be the audience for like the, the Venn diagram of what you enjoy as an audience member shouldn't be a hundred percent what you, what your audience enjoys about you because. Yeah. One of my favorite. Yeah. One, sorry. One of my favorite, favorite comedians is Sebastian Mantiscalco. Uh -huh. He's so like, but he's very different from like he's, <laughs> he's physical. He uses his entire body. He's tall. He's lanky. He like does these great act outs and he has like mm -hmm. vocal inflection. Exactly. I love everything he does, but that's not what I do on stage. And I w sometimes watch his stuff just so I can just laugh. It's yeah, so good. That's awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, okay. we will get your confession. And we're back. Daya, the time has come. Is there anything you would like to tell me? Uh, yes. W well, I have to say <laughs> that I enjoy and I like practicing Buddhism. And I don't know why that's so weird for me to say out loud. It used to be just like a hidden thing that was just for mm -hmm. me. And some people knew about it and they're like, oh, cool, cool. You do your spiritual thing, but I'm into it. I'm like really into it. I don't think that's embarrassing at all. I do have follow-up questions because Please. is it something Please. that you found on your own? Cause the way you're describing it sounds like you found it and maybe you feel like an outsider a bit to it. Like what's the, what's, driving that sort of like wanting to hide it. I mean, it's, I think a lot of people in the world practice Buddhism. So yes. and I, I don't think of it as automatically something. I mean, if you told me you were, you know, a tiki torch bearer in the uh, Proud Boys, I, I would be a little more shocked, but uh, I don't automatically see an intrinsic um, shame to being Buddhist. So I'm curious yeah, yeah. where that hiding comes from. There, there, there's not, uh, yeah, there's not a shame to being Buddhist. 
but there is a shame to being associated with, quote, spiritual people in Northern California. Oh, so, okay. So like the, the kind of like pseudoscience? Yes, that, but it's not because I know Buddhism is not, but I know what you're saying. There's a lot of newcomers to the spiritual world who kind of blend yes. a lot of philosophy and old world religions along with new age practices. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, so the so the reason I keep it on on the low is because uh, people think that Buddhism is anything. Like they're like, <laughs> I love the Happy Buddha. I bought one in Chinatown last oh my year. God. They'll, they'll no. think that's Buddha. or they're like, oh my god, that cat that moves its arm. I no, love that's a, that's the Neko from Japan. That's not right. Little... I know. So I mean. <laughs> So I think that even as uh, as woke as Northern California, Just say white people, okay? No. <laughs> well, but sometimes it's like I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, has it ever been anyone else who has been? It's interesting there? because we ha so there are times when I like as an American haven't gone out of my way to learn more about other cultures. Um, like my boyfriend's Salvadoran, and I really didn't know much about El Salvador's like history and like. Mm -hmm before he has told me and then I kind of thought like well it is a blind spot in that I'm not being like well I don't need to know because it's like it, we should have been taught more things but then it did give me a moment to reflect and go well why do I know so much about um you know Taiwan and I get mad when people don't but it's like we're not taught that in school so it may be similar where the rest of us who have uh you know experience with other histories that aren't taught in American schools have to just assume that people don't know, which it's like, right. oh shit, I maybe should go out of my way to learn more because I don't think America did a good job. <laughs> yeah, so I'll address your question. How it came about is I was raised um, by Hindus. My parents are from India, uh, but they're not Hindu in the sense that they're like hardcore fundamentalists. My dad okay. is a scientist, so he's mm -hmm. very logical. Um, and my mom is very much like, you should make your own decision. So they're vegetarian, mm -hmm. they're Hindu. And growing Are there up, multiple there multiple sects of Hindu, or is, I'm thinking like J Jainism is a different. I mean, this is where my yeah. ignorance will come out. No, no, I'm it's like, it's totally okay. I'm to gonna ask because I'm sure if I have yes. questions, other people will too. So I'm gonna like be the uh, vessel of ignorance. But yes. uh... so Hinduism uh, is you know a, a major world religion. Jainism is also a major world religion that that sort of came about um, as as a way to reform Hinduism. Gotcha. So. Uh, there were things that Jains didn't like about the way Hinduism was practiced. Same with Buddhism. Like the Buddha rejected the caste system. Mm -hmm. uh, the Buddha rejected uh, e even to pick a side, to be like, there is a deity. There is a yeah. God. Like you don't have to even believe in that. Uh, if I will say Buddhism, I have more experience with in a weird way. I was never Buddhist, but I went to a Buddhist Chinese school um, called Siji in like growing up. And, uh, and my grandma did a lot of volunteer work with them. So, and they like, they would teach... And it wasn't like in an evangelical way the missionaries do, but they do like teach the philosophy, but it's very like, come one, come all. And you, you know, not, I mean, sure, you know, because you're Buddhist, but for anyone who's not around, I guess as much, it's, it's much more about self and like sort of growth than spreading gospel in that sense. But we would get the little aphorisms and I like, they're all like little, almost like Instagram quotes before Instagram quotes. And they're That's little so books. That's so funny. Just, yeah. yeah. Instagram. But I used to love reading them. They always make me happy because it's like it's great um, wisdom and knowledge in the way that I feel like as you grow older, it actually becomes more deep. You know, you know what I mean? Like when you see people say things like, oh, it's always darkest before the sun. As a kid, you're like, haha, like that's like just a generic hang in there cat poster. Yeah. But then you actually go through some shit and then you're like, it truly is. I see now. There's like another layer of those sort of generic quotes. You became enlightened. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you just like they just open your eyes. So I, I kind so my parents were very much like do your own thing. So I know a lot about Hinduism. There's a lot of things I like about Hinduism. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things I would change if I could. But I, when I got to Northern California, Buddhism is a big deal in Northern California. Oh, okay. uh, there's Spirit Rock in where Marin. you moved to the uh, SF, the city. Yeah, I moved to SF. So I'm after from the South Bay, so it's a little yeah a little suburban, suburban. Right. Well, I mean, there's um, so Spirit Rock is a big place in Marin County where it is very white, but the people who started it were Buddhist practitioners oh. who lived in Burma and Thailand, and Jack Cornfield was a monk for a long time. So, but it is in Marin County, and so people call. 
Spirit Rock the upper middle way. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Isn't it funny? I'm it's so curious, curious about this because you live in the Bay and I and having been on a party bus with the Bojo ladies, I imagine you hobnob with it, like people of all over the wealth uh, structure. So it's interesting because I also can see, like I'm on TikTok and TikTok for some reason has been pushing a lot of witch talk and spiritual, but in that sort of gen generic, like almost like, uh, what's the word? Ambiguous spiritual thing, yes. like kind of like the yes. new agey thing where there's not really boundaries and everyone's like, and it's also a lot of 19 year olds, which I'm happy they're finding uh, their voice, but yes. it's a little strange when it's like white girl after white girl being like, talking about like enlightenment and chakras it's just like i know your heart's in the right place but i don't know enough about the actual like community because there is clearly a community of people finding positive things you know even if they are white and new to it or or came into later in their life and so i think this is super interesting because i don't think the answer is to shame them well, so Spirit Rock is very white and they are trying to do something about it. So the Spirit Rock Leadership Council is like, look, it's too white. We need to have more queer people. We need to have more people of color. Let's train more teachers in the Dharma. So there's this great um, Buddhist teacher named Spring Washam. She's a black woman. There's someone named Lama Rod Owens, who's a queer black man who's written a book about anger in Buddhism mm -hmm. and how you can use anger to transform that into spiritual practice. So there's like a new generation of Buddhist leaders who aren't just like these people in the 60s who went. But I have to say, Jack Kornfield is an OG. So what he does is amazing. He um, got malaria in Burma. He's like sat through like many, many difficult periods. He's, he's gone through a lot of personal challenges himself. And as a 70 something year old man, he goes to the intersection of where he lives and he holds up a sign that says Black Lives Matter. And recently he's been holding up a sign that says Stop Asian Hate. He actually puts into practice mm -hmm. the Buddhist philosophies that he's been teaching for you know 50 years. And I think that's really about what social and racial justice means because yeah. What, what I don't like, I think you pointed out something really good. When someone has like a mishmash of their spiritual beliefs, like chakras, essential oils, astrology. I read, um, you know, Eckhart Tolle's book. They're, they're, they're kind of approaching it as like this buffet style approach, which I think is great. When you're in your 20s, you should expand and try to do all the things you can. Date a variety of people, go to a bunch of different churches, eat food that's weird, travel, like... <laughs> It's about experiencing everything. But I do think that people run away from having a practice because it's yeah. hard. And the only way that you can be more present is sitting in meditation. You have to be f confronted with the difficulty that is sitting and meditation and monkey mind and how hard that is. And there's no other way mm -hmm. to experience, you know, uh, really what your mind is or what the Buddha was teaching, you can be compassionate, you can do acts of service, you can uh, listen to the Dalai Lama, deliver his discourses on Zoom, you can do all of that. But the fundamental practice is, is sitting and knowing your thoughts and emotions and being in that discomfort. And I think new age spirituality pushes away discomfort so as soon as something is ah, too difficult, yeah, wellness even the way it's described well i'm kidding the, what you're describing it i also can see it really helping with stand-up because it's sort of true like you can start with a lot of drive you can even start with raw talent but until you just put the hours in and the stage time like even if you're promising in your first couple of years you know and you get like on some list you nothing really substitutes experience in the long run and in the same way i feel like what you said really resonated about like people in their twenties should experience a lot. And I think that's a difference is experience versus teaching, right? Like I think the reason it feels strange is there's a lot of people who are just experiencing it, trying to teach on TikTok. and I, whatever they're young. So it's like, mostly I'm mad at the algorithm. It's like, <laughs> I don't talk to each other, you know, they'll help each other out. But like, why are they trying to teach me? I don't know. It's just strange, but, uh, and I am still learning, but it's more that thing where, you know, someone's just gotten into something and they're trying to explain it to you. Right. I think that's the feeling like comedy in the same way you w might experiment with your voice, you know, maybe start in storytelling, stand up, you know, one liners. Eventually though, you will find something that you enjoy more and maybe like craft that into your 
thing. So I, I, I don't know, does this practice in like spirituality bleed into your work life and your, the way you approach comedy? Yeah, so that that's a very good point that you brought up about how uh, this is this is a, a a model or a template for almost anything in life because uh, I've talked to many standups and if and you know you get that special or you get that thing where you're on a list or your tweet goes viral or a video goes viral and then four days later you come off of that high and you feel you're terrible sad. and and that and that's. <laughs> That's a microcosm of our lives because yeah. we're always chasing that high. But one of the things in Buddhism is equanimity, which is, and mm. this is very hard to do. I'm not enlightened. I'm just trying my best, which is when really terrible things happen, you try to hold it with the same compassion and you know uh, equal feeling as if some something really amazing happens. So if something really amazing happens, you're not like, I'm amazing, I'm the best person in the world. And when something terrible happens, you don't go, oh my God, I am, I am, ter I belong in the gutter, I, I hate myself. So it's, you don't let external, you know, circumstances tell you if you're a good comic or not. You don't let mm -hmm. external circumstances tell you if you're a good human being or if you're allowed to live or if you're compared to anyone. So equanimity is a big part of Buddhist practice, but so is compassion both self-compassion and compassion for others. And sometimes in these kind of new agey practices where people are like, I'm just aligning my chakras and I just, I don't have the spoons to really help you out with your petition today. And I'm like, what you're telling me is you're so focused on yourself and self-absorption, you cannot show compassion for other living beings. Uh -huh. And I think that's the that's the real threat of new age spirituality. It yeah. makes people so individual focused that one of the mm. things in Buddhism is, in Theravada Bu Buddhism, which I practice, you take refuge in the Buddha, you take refuge in the Dharma, which is the way, the teachings, and the third is you take refuge in the Sangha. And the Sangha is the community and the mm. group. So even if you're a monk and you're celibate and you've given up eating delicious food and you'll never have a chocolate chip cookie in your life and you have to shave your head and wear these boring clothes with no fashion, although Dalai Lama is very fashionable. He yeah, looks... I was going to say that's very much, uh, I feel like anything is fashion. Yes. In the sense that, that's why I've always been, I mean, I have a, I, I, I used to work in fashion briefly, but I feel like there are for sure like way too overboard appropriation, but in general, whenever you see collections inspired by, as long as there's a conversation and it's not just like colonialism. Right. Um, it, I always find like taking, not taking, borrowing, be honoring, as long as it's like clearly some sort of right. homage in right. a way that is research and has a conversation, I always find interesting. But I bring that up because I'm like, ugh, I, I don't want to be like, I don't think I'd, you know, you shouldn't wear a uh, monk inspired fashion if you're not. <laughs> But I imagine that, like, fashion, I, I love it. But I imagine that elements of monk fashion have influenced collections. Sure, know? and 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 those colors look great on his skin tone. So I'm not. There's no shade there. I'm just saying, even monks who've given up everything, they live in a community. And yeah. one of the things about New Age spirituality is how self-centered and how selfish it is. Mm. But when something happens, like mm -hmm. a black man who is just minding his own business mm -hmm. and trying to live his life is killed in broad daylight. Mm. New age spirituality is like, we'll just manifest good vibes oh for him. But, yeah, but that's- There was someone no. saging uh, next to me at one of the protests. Yes, yeah, you should do that. You should sage, you should send good but vibes. they were doing it at the protest. And I mean, maybe it was because it was very obviously two white girls who were there for the first time. But based on the conversation, they were very like confused. Right. But I was like, I mean, I'm glad you're doing what helps you to right. like the rituals, but it's a little bit, Right, a but part bit, of uh, patronizing to come here but, and be like the sage will take the racism away. Exactly, because part of Buddhism, this is the third thing. So I've talked about compassion, equanimity. Um, you also have to understand someone else's suffering. Mm -hmm. So the Dalai Lama on his live stream, he's like a, a black man in America was killed, and this is suffering. This mm -hmm. is the suffering that we we we're part of. The Dalai Lama is a refugee. He's you know, one of the oldest refugees in India because he, they had to leave their country. He experiences suffering. So part b being Buddhist isn't just about checking out and not experiencing your feelings and just being flat. Yeah. It's about crying when someone who is yeah. killed um, just because of the color of his skin. It's about feeling, you know, empathy when 
you know, my family's from India. People are, bodies are being piled on top of each other yeah. because of the coronavirus. It's, so being Buddhist is not just about turning off all of your emotions and putting a happy face and like positive vibes only. That's toxic. Uh, You're kind I of think, describing this bi binary way, uh, I think, the younger generations have grown up, which is this idea of like, if you just find the right thing to do, it will be the secret to everything. And mm -hmm. granted, some, uh, you know, more religions that have been around longer, such as Buddhism, have a clearer path to that than maybe newer ones, you know, that are maybe more rooted in colonialism. But doesn't mean like one is going to be the secret to everything being happy. So I think people get so excited when they find there's another way of thinking that is so much maybe like quicker for them to grow that they think it's it. But you, like you said, you still have to cry. Like you can't learn what suffering is without suffering. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you from the outside go, oh, I get it. Like you still have to get in and your body has to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the part I like about what you said. Like the, when you described um, Jack standing on the street with the sign, it's not that you, it's not binary in that like if, anyone went outside and stood with a sign that that would be like great checklist like it's not about that action by itself but it's the fact that you can see someone who teaches like in a community and has um followers is also comfortable being alone right which is really different from some of the more like extreme cult leaders who seem like they want to enlighten you and then they can't be alone or they can't actually by themselves practice what they preach so i really like that example because it's um it's not about how he seems. It's about him by himself always being the version of himself. Like, and if people did come out and join him, it wouldn't diminish the experience either. Like, he wouldn't be like, get away. I need to look like I'm by myself. Like, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's, it's all about how you are. And hopefully that ripples out to help the world you're in. And you know, that's he, my, my, my take. I mean, I'm not like, you're, you know, what he says on his on his um, in his teachings and his podcast. Sometimes people are real asses to him. They like honk the horn. They're like, why are you doing this? Are you getting paid to do this? Why, why, all lives matter. Like they say all the same shitty things that they would say to anyone. But he's the 70 year old man who's been on Oprah, who's traveled yeah, yeah. the world. The Dalai Lama has met with him. He doesn't have to do this, but he does it because it's an extension of his practice. Yeah, so yeah. just to be in your own cocoon with your healing stones and your essential yeah. oils and your chakras is not enough because you have to take that compassion that you have for yourself and others. You have to understand in human suffering. You have to be able to hold that with the same love that you would hold your own suffering. And also here's something that affects stand up too. There's something called sympathetic joy, which means just because you don't experience it, that doesn't mean you can't be happy for, for someone else. Yeah, true. That's something that stand ups uh, have a hard time with, let's say, yeah, because yeah. if you, your friend made a list and you didn't make a list, you got an audition, someone else didn't get it. It, it, sympathetic joy is another part of practice. And if you cannot be joyful for small things like a flower or like someone, mm -hmm. like a little chocolate or the sun shining on your face, or you can't be happy for the little victories in stand up, you're going to constantly try to fill this hole inside of you wow. with bigger and bigger things. And it's never going to be fulfilled. So, by practicing these concepts, you will free yourself from suffering, which is like, yeah. I hate myself. Why didn't I get this? Why am I not good enough? I'm just going to toxic happy my way through it. So you just, it's, it's really a, it's hard work to be could, Buddhist. Could you even say, I mean, I, I'm not Buddhist, but I feel like a lot of what you're saying, it resonates with how I've been trying to like yeah. live my work, life. But I, no. I wonder, I wonder if this applies to Buddhism or if it's just a different thing, but could you say it's not just about eliminating suffering, but suffering, not repeating the same suffering? Like, cause sometimes I find that the more growth I have, the more I'm like finally undoing bad patterns and learning and knowing how to avoid them. Then there'll be a new level where I'm like, whoa, here's a harder one, but it's new suffering. And it doesn't make me feel like I'm going backwards. It never makes me regret learning a lesson, but it does make me see like, oh, there is no moment where it all goes away. It is kind of like I'm getting better at dealing with bigger waves. And then you kind of feel like really uh, stable and calm because you go, no matter what comes, I now have this pattern I've established of being able to like grow in a way to fit it, even though it's hard. But I don't know if that is like, 
what I guess what it is you're doing this as a practice every day or is there like that you'd mentioned enlightenment are you trying to reach a certain point um, in your practice or it's more just an ever-growing evolution it's an ever-growing evolution because um, so I want to address the point you said about suffering uh, you know our goal is to eliminate suffering for ourselves and for all all beings like so we wish that all beings don't have suffering that all beings are happy all beings are liberated and when you say all in buddhism it really does mean all so it means we wish that donald trump is free mm -hmm. from suffering and happy and that he is safe and protected I what do you not... define as because there's enlightenment where you are comfortable with suffering but sometimes i think like when you're talking about new age people focus too much on just one thing i worry being just happy all the time is bad too just like the earth has seasons where it's cold and yes. hot but we know it's gonna be okay i don't know because i don't want to wish suffering on anyone but then when i think about what i've learned from it i get more and more comfortable with knowing it'll happen to me again but not trying to find it i don't know how this maybe i'm still on my journey uh, well, well, we all are. And I was just going to say that the reason I brought up the Donald Trump example is I am not at the enlightened stage where I wish him peace and <laughs> lives and happiness. He destroyed America uh -huh. slowly and he made it difficult for brown and black people and Asian people to exist in this country and queer people. It, it, mm -hmm. I really do have so much anger uh, uh -huh. for what has happened to the country. So that is my practice. I have to be like, there may never be a time when I can extend compassion to Donald Trump. So my journey is really, can I transform this anger into healing and compassion? I'm not mm -hmm. saying get rid of the anger because you were saying about boundaries. Sometimes if people try to ignore their anger or ignore feelings of, oh shit, this doesn't feel good. They're ignoring yeah. their boundaries. So if someone comes up to you after a show or me after a show and they're like, you're funny for a girl or I didn't know Asians could be funny or whatever. And then I'm just like, I need to step away from you, sir. Like, so that's a boundary and it comes from being disrespected and angry, but I don't have to punch the person. Yeah, I don't have to hurt. like- And you don't uh, have to hug them either. You could just be like- You don't have to hug them. That hurt me and I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, you don't have to be nice to them. You can disengage. So part of mm. Buddhism is knowing when to engage and knowing when to disengage and hopefully doing it in a way that doesn't create more harm. And mm -hmm. to your point about the journey, we, we, we are trying to eliminate suffering, but just as long as there's imperfect humans, someone is gonna cut you off in traffic. Mm -hmm. Someone is gonna say something racist. Someone is going to um, you know, do something annoying. So we mm -hmm. just have to sit with that and not be attached to it. Like, you know how some people are so attached to their sadness, they think yeah, that's yeah. what makes them a good comic. And then yeah. some people are so attached to being a positive person that they have no depth. So all of it is equanimity. You, you, you say, like you were saying the seasons, winter is not, oh, winter is shitty. Or summer is not, summer is amazing. It's like, this is a season, this is what it is. I accept this. And winter is nice because you get to have hot chocolate. And yeah. summer is nice because you get to wear a sundress and, you know, people like look hot. I, I mean, I, I don't know. That's <laughs> yeah, not... yeah, I know what you mean. Well, I'm curious because you mentioned the um, the comic thing and I, I have like I was never that spirit. I've always been really interested in and fascinated by like philosophy and spirituality, mostly uh -huh. because I'm trying to figure myself out. But um, really wasn't until we went into quarantine that I dived more into sort of like even the metaphysics of stuff, but mm. I'm sometimes I almost like feel like you're talking about hiding it earlier. And I, as a comedian, I, yeah. I don't know if this is why you were saying this but, or what you were getting to, but sometimes I feel like it takes away from funny or if I'm too serious yes. and then people are listening to, for, I know nobody's listening to me for their wisdom, but it just, I wonder, like, do you feel sometimes like you have to compartmentalize all the growth because or do you, you know, like how does, has it affected your sort of persona and comedy or have you made jokes about, like how do people respond to knowing, you know, cause I do, I don't know if this makes sense. Like comedians like to self deprecate and almost like live in the, the sort of bad part of themselves for the, you know, show, show part. Yeah. But a lot yeah. of spirituality is about accepting everything and not having that conflict, which can be alter or counterintuitive to comedy. 
Yeah, I think that how I've handled it is mostly sort of off stage. So, like I said, dealing with internet trolls, dealing with mm. like some comic who says something shitty. Um, there was a comedian who, said, like on a show, said some pretty harassing and demeaning and uh, annoying and just unwanted attention type of mm. stuff in a public way. And I had to address it. And I really sat with my practice and I thought about it and I said, I don't wish this person harm. I don't want them dead. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to like suffer more because of it. I don't want, I don't want hatred because that's just more hatred. Mm -hmm. You know what I really want? I want this person to be better. Yeah, and that's, that's ultimately what will prevent him from doing a shitty thing to somebody else is if he is free from his own suffering, if he's a better mm -hmm. person, if he stops doing this, then mm -hmm. other people will also be free. So that may never happen. He may continue to be shitty for the rest of his life, but wishing harm on him is not gonna make you yeah. know, the cycle stop. So I had to really like sit with my practice for that and figure that out. But on stage, you know, I, I really take heart to, you know, this idea of, are my punching up? Am I punching down? Am I using these words to harm people? Am I using these words to uh, demean anyone? And um, yeah, I, I make fun of a lot of dumb Republican conservative <laughs> people who I think are, 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 are anti-science and anti-diversity and anti-American things that I believe in. And it does make me angry. And I don't know how to handle that. I don't know if I would sit and say, hey, let's uh, have some vegan uh, food and practice Buddhism together. I don't know if that's possible for me in but this life. But you lifetime. handle it through comedy. I mean, that's one yeah. way I feel yeah. like you, comedy does cut some tension. Yeah. And um, I do think it does take some of the edge of anger and mm -hmm. I mean, you can still feel angry like I'll, of course I still feel angry at a lot of injustices but yeah I can distill how I feel into something that's more palatable to people that I'm not I guess in the sense that I'm like I'm not coming to them with my anger even though I am angry so they get the information of my feelings in the form of a joke which to me is passing on the information in the anger and the truth that I believe um in a way that isn't passing on the anger. And mm. I feel like you do that with your comedy as well. And I could see, it doesn't to me feel like your goal is to hurt anybody when there are punchlines, you know? Yeah. So, you know, again, living in San Francisco, I'm a cis straight person, but my friend group involves a diversity of people. One of my friends is a trans woman and um, we, and she gave me permission to talk about this. We were like having drinks or hanging out, you know, like mm. having a girl's night. And she was, you know, opening up to me about what it's like as a trans woman in our society and getting clocked and being misgendered. And then um, she was like, I'm, you know, she was suing Kaiser because Kaiser wouldn't cover her surgery, but they did do reconstructive surgery for breast cancer survivors, which is cosmetic. Yeah. So, she, so if you're covering that, why don't you cover my surgery? I've just been talking about this to my boyfriend. I was like, it's wild that you that there's like, and also like guys can get hair extensions for balding, but like you can't get, if you're F to M, like there's so many things where I'm like, so, this so is many, really rooted in your body. So many injustices. And so she actually took on Kaiser. She won oh, and, now, yeah. and, and she was one of the first trans women to kind of advocate and they've had her speak. Anyway, so what happened in our conversation is she actually said to me- Can you say her name for people who are curious to check it? We have, or not, or are you, oh, I would- geez. She's not, she's not a comedian, but she's oh, okay. an amazing person. Her, her name is Kenna, and she gave me permission to use her name. Anyway, she's, she's an amazing No, no, because it sounds, I feel like a lot of listeners might be interested in checking out her story if you, she's, like, spoken about it. That sounds Yeah, she's cool. spoken about, uh, yeah, she, she's in the Bay Area. She's, she's not a comic. She's just a cool human being and mm -hmm. very spiritual person. And so she said to me, Daya, the surgeries are so good these days, uh, they can fool a gynecologist. And uh, she just has a way with words, but we were like at a bar or was loud or something. And I and I thought she said, the surgeries are so good these days, they can fool a guy in college. And I was like, 
Really? How how are you experimenting in this way? Like, oh, God. you you have <laughs> like a college. Yeah, yeah. I was like, do you have like a control group or? A, and she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, who are these college guys? She goes, I said gynecologist, and I was like, oh my God. <sighs> We seriously laughed for like half an hour. I was like, and then we were like brainstorming what it would be like. And then I said, hey, can I use this on stage? She goes, absolutely, you can use it on stage. And she and I said, I won't use your name. She goes, you can use my name, I don't care. So I did that joke about like, and then I tagged it with like, but how hard is it to fool a college guy? I could probably do it this week if I want, you know, like they're just, they're, they don't know what they're doing. So. So I, I, I talked about this experience, about my mishearing, and then this joke, and I did it, and there are some queer people, so I've done it many, many times with mm. trans folks in the audience, with uh, you know cisgender people in the audience, with lots of different, and people have responded well. But one time, it didn't land well. Mm. And there are some p queer people who were like, why were you talking about a trans woman's vagina? And I said, I never said the word vagina. And they said, we, we heard you, you said vagina. And I said, I never said the word vagina. And they, they said, why? They made it up because of the yeah. bias. That they yeah. Oh, and then they were like, well, why did, Why are you talking about trans women tricking men into having sex with them? And I said, no, that was not the joke thing. at all. So what I learned huh. is that I can get permission from the person who the joke is about. We can be cool. It can be a joke about me as a dumb cis person mishearing. And mm -hmm. that's what happened. But how it lands for people mm. is that they bring their own experience because yeah. these these people have been shit on they've been yeah. told they're x y or z or don't fit in or there's systemic mm -hmm. um, inequality against trans people in america so even though the joke was written without the word vagina or mm -hmm. trans people or anything like that the way it landed for some people was hurtful yeah so what you well, have you're, to... you're kind of describing this idea that not, I mean, people aren't a monolith, but we yes. do start to take these shortcuts because we're trying to correct course correct. So, of course, you know, LGBT centers are going to put out like kind of blanket brochures of like, here, use these words, don't do this. And um, that's good as in general. But then beyond that, you know, getting to know people as people is actually the next step, because then you're like, oh, there's not one way to treat all trans people. Just yep. like if one person says, OK, it doesn't mean it's OK there, but also not they're just not not all people are the same so that is like the next thing which i feel like is really interesting as a performer who has to constantly go up to strangers because you don't always get the benefit of getting to know someone before they listen to you talk or them getting to know you you know yeah so 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 for me i had to really think about that because i was like i didn't say any of those things they said but Comedi as comedians, we know that when audiences walk off stage, yeah. they don't remember our name. They don't remember the set. They, they don't remember the punchline. They sometimes remember the setup. They say mm. things like, "Oh, you had that joke mm -hmm. about eating vegan food, or you had that joke about, um, you know, Joe Biden being, you know, this or that." They, they will remember generalities, but they, they they're not going to remember how I phrased the joke so carefully to be respectful. They're going to hear through the filter of their experience. So the reason I bring that up is I caused suffering that day. Yeah, I caused pain for people. And that was not my intention. But uh, some people will be like, oh, they're too sensitive or, you know, you're a comedian, it's just a joke or whatever. But I do think we have the obligation to reflect mm -hmm. why that hurt. And why that hurt is because if you're often the butt of a joke, if you're often the person yeah. who after the after the setup is I have a trans woman friend or I have a friend she's a trans woman we're going to dinner, your whole experience is like I'm gonna be shit on. Someone is gonna say something mean. That's a useful life lesson to have, which yeah. goes back to empathy. So I think sometimes comedians short circuit that and they're like, you can't tell me what to say. I'm a comic. It's just a joke. You're overly sensitive. I'm like, but you have missed out on this whole experience of how to build empathy. Will I do oh, that yeah. joke again? Of course I will. If someone is mad at me for it, I will allow them to be mad at me and I will listen. Uh, it doesn't change. I mean, that joke is old, so I might not do it again anyway. Yeah. What I'm saying is it's about my friendship with a person and it's a yeah. real thing that happened, but will I be careful how I word that in the future? Yes, because I don't wanna hurt people, I wanna get a laugh. And you can also, I think that's really well said because it, um, it sounds like what you're doing is actually 
editing and growing, which sounds yeah. like the point to like light. Like you even said like, oh, I'm not in line, neither am I, you know, nobody yeah. really is. No. Um, it, nobody who's doing comedy is in line. No, yeah, we're right. be subjecting ourselves to that suffering. But um, that being said, it's like, of course that means there's still growth. And when people, cause I've had this happen too, not in that specific situation, but like as a comedian, like times when you feel a little defensive cause you're like, actually, you just don't know that it's smart. But then yeah. it's like, well, that's bad. Cause my job is to not have to explain it to you. So sometimes I find like I've recently been more, um, when I do get pushback or I sense people are sensitive, even if I don't necessarily think they are coming, like in this situation, it sounds like there's a lot uh, to, you know, justify their feelings. But like sometimes when people hear white people, they'll call me racist. But it has actually helped me after I got defensive to sit back and go, well, why? Because I know they don't hate me. They didn't start by wanting to hate me. Maybe unconsciously they didn't want to like me. But what can I do with the information I just got that something I didn't think was offensive offended someone? And then I take that negative space. And I found that it is a kind of hard because it requires like being like, I got to rewrite this. But I've created, like, I think funnier um, versions of jokes from it. But, like, uh, one example I'll give is, like, I think you've heard this, but I won't tell a joke, but I have a joke right now about, like, normalizing soft dicks. <laughs> it did kind of come out of me having a lot of dick jokes and then sometimes noticing guys would be uncomfortable but wanting to be supportive. And then me thinking, like, well, you know, there are a lot of female comics who body shame dicks. Like, to me, I was kind of just, like, it's funny to talk about dicks and butts and in a way that's not shaming, but I do think a lot of times you don't know where it's going to go and small dicks, limp dicks, you know, they get made fun of that in a way that made me start thinking like, how would I feel? Like, it's like how girls feel uncomfortable when guys make, you know, smelly pussy jokes. I'm like, huh, I would probably be uncomfortable, but want to laugh to be like everyone else. So that's where that joke came out of. Cause then I was like, I want to apologize. And then I found that I got to me like a better place where I could, accept everyone's viewpoints but it made me realize my point it was never to make fun it's always just to have fun so if yes. i did it wrong then i doesn't mean i can't do it it just means maybe there's another way to do it better you know right, right. And, and i do think that some people's opinion matters less like one time i did a joke about jesus and someone was very upset they're like i i don't want you to take the lord's name in vain and at that moment you have to be like <sighs> you know we just don't see eye to eye because yeah. We have gods that have elephant heads that are all kinds of like blue, green, extra arms. I think we can make fun of any kind of deity, you know? So I think it's, it's, and I have a spiritual practice. So yeah. I think part of it is also being able to laugh at things that are taboo. Well, you're so, talking about knowing your boundaries too, because yeah. you're not just saying, oh, your opinion doesn't matter because you're insert a character trait or whatever. Right, you're right. saying, I listened and here's why. I heard what you said and I, because I am in touch with myself, know why I don't agree with you and why that's okay. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just hearing someone mad at you and going, well, you know, you're a Christian, so I don't believe you. Like, cause it's not about that. It's about, oh, I see you got offended because you haven't looked, you feel insecure about your own practice, which I won't explain to you. You can figure out on your own, but like, I don't need to change my job. You know, like you're actually listening instead of just blocking them out. Yeah, and also Christianity is the majority religion of America, and we insert Christianity into everything yeah. and the way we are, and even in Congress. And so mm -hmm. it's 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 still punching up. And I think you know, like when the Dalai Lama says the Chinese tortured us and they kicked us out of our house, and they are going to pick my successor, who's really not my successor, and they've jailed a bunch of people who are incarnations of my brother monks and they have committed violence. He's telling the truth. Yeah. He's not going to sugarcoat that because he's a Buddhist. He's also gonna say, and I send them compassion, and mm -hmm. I send them healing. But were they mm -hmm. assholes to me? Absolutely they were. So yeah, I think yeah. you can talk about the truth in a very direct way without sugarcoating and be like, I have compassion for how much suffering they must have to be such shitty people. Well, you free yourself. Well, you were talking about being free from suffering because being angry or fearful, you're the one walking around with the anger, not the person you're mad at, which right. is kind of like, <laughs> it's like if you want, I don't know, if, I can't think of a really good metaphor. So I don't know why I thought of like a stink bomb, but you're like, I really <laughs> want this person to have a stink, but you have to carry it around all day. It's like, yeah. you're the one that smells, bro. Um, <laughs> 
But I, yeah, I love that. I think that's a great place to end. I feel like, but I do want to, I just thought of something because when you were saying punching up, punching down, and I was like, huh, that's really interesting because I, we've always heard that don't punch down. But then I was trying to think like lately, I feel like a lot of my jokes, I'm like trying to not punch. And then I'm like, how can you stay funny? And my new, you literally just thought of this, so I'll test it on you and you can tell yes. me if I should say this or not. I probably shouldn't ever say this out loud, actually, but I feel like instead of punching anyone, I'm just trying to jerk everyone off. Like everyone comes, like it's just like that's, that's you're great. laughing because you're coming, and, and I'm just trying to find the sweet spot that hits everybody's G spot, and nobody gets punched. That's I guess that's what a show hopefully is what I'm working for. That's that's really great. You want everyone to have an enjoyable time, and you don't want anyone to go home disappointed or be like that was a little rough i didn't like it because that's or, the release right the punch yeah. i feel like there is we're looking for some release in comedy yeah. but it doesn't have to be a punch it could be a squirt you know i don't know <laughs> i like i like how you're so positive of all bodies and all ways that they may uh, like uh, you know, but i think that there's something to that because what we are doing to the audience is we're seducing them in some way we're like hi mm -hmm. we just met I want you to do this thing for me. Laugh, 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 laugh. Okay, now laugh some more. Okay, now yeah. not. Okay, now do this. We are in. We're 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 the tops, right? Interesting. And 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 so we're really you know creating that environment. We're in control. So I don't think your analogy is too far <laughs> off. I think. That, yeah, it's a really just an analogy. Please, nobody send me anything to jerk off. Okay. <laughs> Um, Your fans will take you seriously, you think? No, they won't. I say this shit all the time. I'm very, actually, like, quite prude in the sense that I, like, really don't. I mean, I th I think I just love, I think I'm a 13-year-old boy at heart in that I love. I love that. Joking about it. But, yeah, sometimes I think I need to be like, oh, you remember, you, people see you as a woman on the internet. So you, you really can't be making jokes about just our culture. Yeah, <laughs> Your I'm audience sure. members. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, whatever. You, you That's can. on them. That's how you'll they be, think. You'll be you. <laughs> well, I think this is a really fun place to end. I have really enjoyed this conversation, Daya. Where can people find you? Um, check out your comedy. Is there anything you want to direct them to? Yes. Uh, D-H-A-Y-A is how you spell my first name. So DayaComedy.com is my website. If you want to book me for something, find me through my website. Uh, I just joined the WJ, so I'm a writer. Oh, congratulations. So, so I'll hire me to write for you. You also, were a writer before you joined them. That's how you joined you. them. So thank you. I'm an, I'm, they have given me, a, a, you know, when you join, they, they make you get a tattoo. So, you know, they, they're, I, they've tattooed me now. Uh -huh. so, you know, it's, WG. It's like, uh, it just says, I have notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it hurts. It hurts every time. Yeah. So, uh, and then follow me on Twitter for um, rapper and math puns that only Teresa enjoys. So that's <laughs> at Die Alive because that X gonna give it to you was when DMX died. So oh, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm very skilled at the intersection between math and 90s that's rappers. Relevancy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> peace, peace to DMX who died after addiction and uh, he was a great talent, so I'm not making fun of his death. I'm making fun of... You're paying of homage. Yeah, I love yeah, you. Yeah, paying homage. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. You can follow this podcast at Tell Me Anything Pod on Instagram and follow me at Teresa Lee Bot on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you. Bye.